Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you for your loving kindness and your faithfulness. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for the joy. Thank you for your joy that is in our soul. Thank you for the joy that is in our spirit. Thank you for the overflowing love that you've shed abroad by your spirit in our heart. Thank you for the confidence you have given us to approach you. Thank you for what you are said to do. We love you, Lord. We love you. We bless your holy name. Thank you for your word that strengthens us. Thank you for your love that revives us. Thank you for your spirit that makes us alive. We give you the glory and we give you the praise. And we ask that you speak to us tonight. Reveal to us your oracles tonight. In the name of Jesus. And cause our hearts to be strengthened. Prepare us for the journey ahead, Lord. Give us this day our daily bread. And restore our soul. Lead us in this path of righteousness for your name's sake. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Um, I want to welcome everyone again to this broadcast. Apostle Victor Aiden is my name, and this is Live Spring Assembly um, here in the heart of London. And I want to thank God for everyone that is watching me tonight. I want to believe that God has been good to you um, and that you're enjoying the goodness of God. And I pray that you will continue to experience and enjoy. Um, the generosity of God even in the name of Jesus as he showers his blessings upon you in Jesus name that God will grant you strength in your bodies he will grant you strength in your heart he will make your mind sound even in the name of Jesus and he will grant all your heart desires in righteousness in Jesus name um, I've got a very very quick assignment tonight um, we're going to be talking about captured Okay, if you've seen the flyer for the service, the title of tonight's Sound Mind session is called Captured. And it's just a, a branch of uh, a tree that we're looking at. Okay, we, we started talking about Dominion on Sunday. And I said for the next few weeks, I'm, few weeks, I'm going to stay on that topic of Dominion until I have released in my spirit that I have communicated the burdens of God in this season. As far as that um, contemplation is um concerned um so tonight we're going to be looking about captured the servants of god um the holy spirit laid this on my heart and i perceive by the spirit of god that these are the emphases um that the spirit is shining its light upon in the times that we're in these are the emphases um from the corridors of heaven these are the discussions of the throne room um, in the presence of God and it is our responsibilities as the priests of God to bring this knowledge to the awareness of God's people so that those whose hearts favor the causes of God can run can run can do the biddings of God and so I, I, I want to trust the Holy Spirit to give us inspiration tonight um, to quicken our hearts to grant us an understanding heart that we may know what God is saying okay um, so I pray for you that you will have an understanding heart tonight that you wouldn't just listen to me um, like you hear preachings all the time but you will really hear what God is saying and what God has to say to you um, as your assignment in the big picture of what God is doing even in the name of Jesus okay so my primary text tonight I mean I'm gonna bounce from scripture to scripture but I, I want to start tonight from the book of 1 Samuel okay again I'm talking about captured the servants of God okay the servants of God um, um, yeah so let's start from the book of 1 Samuel tonight I'm gonna to read the book of 1 Samuel to you I'm gonna jump back and forth um, the intention will be to communicate what I want you to capture tonight or what the Holy Spirit is saying to you um, so if you have your Bibles, please open them with me tonight to the book of 1 Samuel. And if you if you just follow me with your heart um, and, and, and just listen to what the Spirit is saying tonight in Jesus' name. So 1 Samuel chapter 1 from verse 9. Okay, this is a very peculiar story in the Bible. If you're familiar with, with Bible stories, um, this is the story of Hannah. And if you're not, 
just follow me you will understand what this is all about okay so there was a woman in the bible okay her name was hannah and she was married to a man who had uh, two wives okay so it was hannah and benina okay and the other wife was having children and and anna wasn't having any child any children and she was very sad um so sorrowful um, and she would go to Shiloh and Shiloh was a place where people gathered to, to worship God and they bring their sacrifices every year and Anna would go to Shiloh and she would go year after year crying to God and asking God for a child because this became mockery for Anna you see she didn't have a child um, and the other wife who had many children would mock Anna um, but she had a very good husband okay who didn't look down on her who was believing with her that God will you know, open a womb and give her a child. And eventually, there was this particular year that Anna went to Shiloh and her request um, that she made to God changed. And we saw that God gave a different response as well um, to this request. And that is what I want us to focus on tonight. Um, I'm, I'm, when I, um, all my life growing up in church, I've heard preachers preach um, about the scripture and every time they preach about the scripture, the emphasis will be the fact that um, when you ask God for something and you don't consider God first in your request, most often than not, you wouldn't get a response. But the, the quick way to get an answer from God when you pray to him is make sure that in your request, God is number one, God is priority, then you stand a chance. Um, most of the time when I and, and then some people will use the scripture for if you've been experiencing mockery in any area of your life um, God can turn it around you know people use the scripture for so many things but the Holy Spirit spoke to me from a completely different perspective as far as the scripture is concerned so I want you to follow me with your heart tonight and God will bless you okay so 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 9 so I've, I've, I've given you the context of the story so let me pick out my text now um, it says, once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli, the priest, was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Now, I want you to start taking note of certain things as I continue to read. So take note of Eli, the priest. Okay? Take note of um, Hannah who went to pray. Now, my emphasis is not on Anna. Okay? My emphasis is on the priesthood okay, and being the servant of God. So follow me with your, with your heart tonight. Now, Eli was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. And then verse 10, Anna was in deep anguish. I explained why to you. I already explained why that is to you. Crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. Verse 11, she made a vow. O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to you, his heir will never be caught. Now, I'm going to continue reading, but I just wanted to um, make a statement. Now, Hannah prayed to God and she, the Bible said she made a vow. In other words, she made a commitment to say, God, if you can commit to giving me a child, I will do this in return, okay? And what she vowed was that she would give the child back to God. So if God should give her a son, she would give the son back to God so that the son can, God can own the son for, the, for, for all the lifetime of this son, okay? Now, I want you to begin to pay attention now to the lifetime commitment that Hannah made on behalf of an unborn child. She made, she entered into a covenant or a contract with God on behalf of this boy. Okay, on behalf of this child. She was asking God for a child and she said, look, if you give me a son, she didn't just say give me any child. She said, give me a son. Give me a male child. And, and I am entering into an agreement with you now, God, that if you give me this male child, I will give him back to you. And the, the implication of that is that he will serve you. He will be yours all his lifetime. Okay? Now, and I want to jump now to my next verse of contemplation. Okay, so I want to jump to verse 23 now. 
Okay? But let me jump to verse 21. Okay? Now, the next year, Elkanah, which, which was who was um, Hannah's husband, Elkanah and his family went on their annual trip to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. But Anna did not go. At this time, now she had, had she had given back to the son. Okay? Um, actually, let me start from... Verse 19. Okay? The entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. Then they returned home to Ramah. Okay, where, where they lived. And when Elkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea. And in due time, she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel. For she said, I asked the Lord for him. Okay, so the Lord glad, granted her request. Okay, the Lord gave her a son. Now the next year, verse 21 now, Elkanah and his family went on their annual trip to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. But Hannah did not go. She told her husband, wait until the boy is weaned. Then I will take him to the tabernacle and leave him there with the Lord permanently. Okay, so she intended to make good of her promise. Okay, and verse 23, when whatever you think is best, Elkanah agreed. Okay, so the husband agreed to, you know, the, the foregoing. Stay here for now and may the Lord help you keep your promise. So she stayed home and nursed the boy until the boy was weaned. Okay? And then when the child was weaned, Anna took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh and he brought along with the boy a three-year-old bull for sacrifice and a basket of flour um, and some wine. Now, verse 27 now, I jump ahead again because I want to get to my contemplation tonight. I asked the Lord to give me this boy and he granted my request. Now, I have now I am giving him to the Lord and he will belong to the Lord his whole life and they worship the Lord there now I want to read that verse 28 one more time it says now I am giving him to the Lord and he will belong in other words it will be the property it will be owned by God, it will belong. You know, if I, I can say, this Bible belongs to me, okay? It is my property, I own it, okay? Now, maybe someone gifted this to me, but they gifted it to me so that it belongs, to, so that it now will belong to me, okay? Now, Hannah took this boy that she vowed to give to God, and she took, when, when she gave birth to the boy now, and the boy had been weaned, okay? She took the boy and took the boy back to God. And this was the statement she made. 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 28. Now I am giving him to the Lord. And he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worship the Lord there. So let me start tonight. What does it mean to be captured? Oh, who are the captured? To be captured simply means to be in permanent slavery. And it means someone who is stronger took hold of someone who is weaker to make them their belonging. And this remains until maybe someone stronger comes to, comes to snatch them or the one who captured or who has taken this slave decides to sell the slave or they decide to free the slave okay but to be captured simply means to be taken and to be owned by someone else now the Captivity that I'm talking about here or being captured that I'm talking about here is not the way the slave trade is where you just, you know, the way um, certain nations came into our countries and captured our forefathers and made them slaves and forced them into hard labor against their will. Now, this is not the kind of capturing that I'm talking about here. Just follow me and you will understand what I mean tonight. The Holy Spirit is speaking and I hope you would 
lend your heart and you would really desire and understand and how to capture what the Spirit is saying tonight. So, Hannah took her son and she intentionally or purposefully gave him to God as a slave. And she gave him to God as a captured slave. She gave him to God to belong to God all the days of his life. So this boy didn't even grow to understand free will. He didn't grow to be another boy. Do you understand? Another boy who was given birth to by his father and his mother who lived in his home and grew to figure out what he wanted to do with life. From birth, this boy was consecrated to God. And immediately it was win. In, in, in other words, immediately the boy could live with someone else. Okay? Immediately the mother has given the first round of care to the boy. Okay? And the boy could now live apart from the mother. Okay? The boy was given to God. And so his life, he had not even become so conscious of life as, as far as choosing what to do is concerned. He was given to God so that the only thing available for the boy to choose was God. Okay? This is a life that is captured. A life that does not have an alternative. A life that the only path available to tread is the path of being a servant of God. I'm going somewhere tonight. And so, um, and so that, that, was, that was what happened. And I gave the boy to God. And in 4 Samuel chapter 2, um, there was a song there. It was the prayer of Anna that he prayed to God. Um, praising God for granting a request. And the last verse in that prayer, okay, is verse 11 of the prayer. Okay, and of course the scripture just continued. And in that, that verse 11, it says, Then Elkanah returned home to Ramah with Samuel and the boy, without Samuel, sorry. And Elkanah returned home to Ramah without Samuel. In other words, they took the boy to Shiloh gave the boy to the house of the Lord and they returned back to their home which was in Ramah, okay? They returned back without Samuel. And then the part B of that verse 11 says, and the boy served the Lord by assisting Eli the priest. I repeat again, and the boy served the Lord by assisting Eli the priest, okay? So the boy began. He entered into the service of God. The boy began to serve the Lord. But remember that what preceded his serving the Lord was because that he was captured. He was a captive. His mom sold him to slavery, so to say. His mom took him. So he was a, he was, um, he was a free boy. He was just another child. Okay? He was given back to, but the mom took him. As soon as he was weaned, the mom took him and the mom sold him to slavery. The mom gave him in captivity to God. He gave him to God. And the consequence of him being given to God as a captured slave was that he entered into the service of the Lord. Just like if, 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 if a man should buy a slave, the slave will begin to serve the master. Okay? So Samuel was given to the house of the Lord as, as a captured slave. Do you understand what I'm saying? He was His mom gave him and he became a property of the temple. He was given to God. And so, because he didn't have, there was nothing else his life was good for. The only thing that Samuel's life was good for now is that he will serve the Lord by attending to the priest of the Lord, Eli, at the time. And then verse 12 says, chapter 2, Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12 says, Now, El, the sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord or for their duties as priests. So now I'm, I'm, I'm taking you gradually now. So I said the first emphasis I want you to I wanted you to pay attention to was the servant of God. Okay? Who was Eli, who was presided over the services of the Lord 
at Shiloh where people would come every year to worship God with their offerings. And then I drew your attention to this woman called Anna who was barren, didn't have a child. And she prayed to God to give her a child and she vowed that should God give her this child, she would give this child back to God as God's belonging. That, that, that God will own the child all the days of his life. And God made good um, um, his own part of the bargain. God gave her the son. And she made good her own part of the bargain too. She brought the son as she has purposed in her heart to God and she gave him to God to serve, to be, to belong to God all the days of his life. And I said the um, consequence of that was that the, the, the only thing is like the, li the boy's life was condemned to only one use and it was to serve, to be, to become a slave of God, to serve God all the days of his life. And I will begin to draw correspondence because you may begin to tell me, oh, but that was in the Old Testament. Most of the epistles that Apostle Paul wrote, okay, the greeting by which he opens his letter, he, he would often say, I, Paul, an apostle of the law of God by Jesus Christ, um, a born servant of God. I will read the book of Romans to you. I'll read Romans chapter 1 so that I will. I, I don't just want you to take my word for it. I would read it according to how it's written in the scriptures. But I, I'm beginning to lay emphasis tonight on servanthood. And I began by saying what precedes servanthood is captivity. It is that the one that must serve God must first be captured by God. Now, in, in the case of Samuel, his captivity began before his birth. Do you understand that? He was already, he was already consecrated to God. He was already a vow. He was, he was, um, libra andos cabaliatas. Normally, when you make a vow, you come to redeem your vow by bringing something to God. Okay? Now, the vow that Anna made, the, the substance of fulfillment of the vow was the life of the boy. Was the, was the boy sentenced into a lifetime of service to God. And because he became a captive, Mariba Dalabako Silas, of a vow, the consequence of that was that he was, he was made or he became a servant of God. And in the context of what we're talking about here, he was going to be mentored to become a priest. Follow me closely tonight. I want to show you because it will interest you to know that the intention of God from time immemorial when he, he went into Egypt to rescue his people, to rescue his son Jacob, the intention of God was to make for himself a nation of priests. The intention of God when he went into Egypt was that he wanted to, the Bible says, who has, has, has any God ever rescued a nation from a nation? God wanted to crystallize for himself a nation of priests. So he went into Egypt and he, he wielded power. And with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, he rescued Jacob. He rescued Israel. And the intention of God was to make for himself a nation of priests. But if you, if you read through scriptures and you see the strife of the people with God, God did not succeed in doing that. And so the best that God could do in that nation was to take a tribe for himself. Remember, the original intention of God was to make the whole nation a nation of priests. In a few minutes now, I will explain to you what it means to be a priest. And I will tell you about priesthood. But the intention of God was to make for himself on earth a nation, a whole nation of priests. But when God did not succeed in doing that because of the rebellion and the hard, stiff neckedness of the people, God resorted and he settled for um, a tribe in Israel. So he took Levi as a tribe and he consecrated them to priesthood. Okay? He made them priests. And, and after the Levitical priesthood came the line that fell onto Eli. So Eli was the priest in his time. And, and according to the priesthood um, ordained by God from the day he brought them out of captivity, there was Israel was a nation that was made without a earthly king. Okay? They didn't have a human king. God was their king. And the intention of God was to make for himself a nation of priests who he will be. 
king over. He wanted to be the king of his people. And he wanted them all to be priests. I'm going somewhere tonight. And when God didn't succeed in doing that, he carved out for himself a tribe in Israel. And he made them a tribe of priests. And he gave them the responsibility of priesthood. And he gave them a reward, which was he himself, God. God himself became the reward of the tribe of the priests. And so Eli was the priest of his time. And so um, Samuel, the captured boy now, who now became the servant of God. Because the Bible says, and the boy served the Lord by assisting priesthood. Did you understand that? He began to serve as an aid of priesthood. I'm taking you somewhere tonight. He began to serve as an aid of priesthood. And then God began to, because you see, priesthood, as God could settle in Israel, was made like it was a family affair. So God chose Aaron and God consecrated Aaron as the high priest. And he chose Aaron's family to be to carry the mantle of priesthood. And so God had done the same thing with Eli. He had chosen Eli and his sons and God had desired to make his family um, carry the baton of priesthood. Okay? And the, the scripture then says now, I'm going so all these things are going to make sense in a bit because I want to prophesy. And, and of course, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some disclosures by the Spirit of God tonight. So, in verse 12, it says, now the sons of Eli. Now, Eli was already getting old at this point. Okay, and he was supposed to have been getting ready um, to hand over the priesthood button to his sons, okay, who would carry on the reins of priesthood after him. And at this time, Eli was the judge over Israel. So they didn't have king. So what God would do is God would raise a priest who would become his spokesman over the people. Okay, not to rule the people as, as a king will, but just to be the one who stands and mediates the covenant that God had made. So priests, one of the things that priests do, or the, the assignment of a priest is captured in a word called mediation. So they are mediators of covenants. They stand between God and those whom God has made covenant with to, to, to fulfill the requirements of the covenant on behalf of the people to appease God. Okay, so Eli was the priest, was the high priest, and he he is approaching the time. Um, he is now an old man, and he's approaching the time when he should be handing over the baton of priesthood to his sons to continue mediating the covenant which God had made with the nation Israel. And the Bible then says here in verse twelve that now Eli's sons were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord and for their duties as priests. So, you see, their first disrespect was for God. They had no respect for God. So, they didn't have respect for their priesthood duties. They had no respect for God. And so, they didn't have respect for their priesthood duties. So, Eli was a priest of God. And his family was supposed to be by heritage the line of the priests. But here are the sons that Eli was supposed to hand over priesthood to. And these sons had no respect for God. And they had no respect for their priesthood duties. But on the other hand, there is a boy who the mom gave as a property to God. And this boy became captured by God. And because of this captivity that the boy was given to, he became the servant of God. So here is Eli, who is a servant by a tribal ordination. 
here are the sons of Eli who are supposed to be priests by the same ordinance. But here is a boy. And when I say servants of God, I mean priests. Okay, when I say when I mean when I say priest, I mean the servants of God. And here is a boy, Samuel, who is serving God now. But he is serving God as a captured man, as a captured boy. Only those who are captured can serve God. Only those who are captured can serve God. And what does it mean to be captured? It means to be sold out. To have a life that is lived by the dictate of the one who is your master. As far as Eli's sons were concerned, they, they were just sons of a priest. So they felt they could choose how they would serve God. Because as far as they were concerned, they were not captured, they were free boys, free sons, who had the privilege and, and the highest and the most respected position in Israel then was the position of the priest. And so they, they felt the privilege of belonging to the house of the priest was to enjoy freedom and do whatever they like. So there was no restraint on their life because they, they were free. They were free sons of the priest. But you see, as for Samuel, Samuel didn't have that luxury. His life was already condemned to the service of God. In other words, there was nothing else he was good for. So he was a bond servant. He was a slave. He was captured by the vow his mom made. And so he was sentenced to a lifetime of serving God. And I want to show you what that does. So the sons of Eli were disrespectful to the Lord, disrespectful to their duties as, as priests. So they would they would cheat the people, they would despise the sacrifices brought to God, they would violate women and did all manner of despicable things. But I want to focus on something in verse 18. So 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 11, it says, And the boy served the Lord by assisting Eli, the priest. And then verse 18, the Bible says again, But Samuel, though he was only a boy, served the Lord. He wore a linen garment like that of a priest. You see, he, he, he was sentenced to the life of a priest. Yet, he was just a little boy. So, for Samuel chapter 2, verse 18 says, But the boy Samuel served, though he was a little boy, he was only a boy, served the Lord. And then jumping out to verse 21, he says, And the Lord gave Anna three sons and two daughters. So the mom, Anna, had more children now. Having given the first to God, God gave her more. So, the Lord gave Anna three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. I want you to, I want you to take note of the progression of the life of this born servant, this captured boy. Verse 18 says, Samuel, though he was a little boy, he was only a boy, he served the Lord, he wore linen garments like that, that of a priest. And then verse 21 says, And the Lord gave Anna three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. I want you to underline that he grew up in the presence of the Lord. If I jump a few verses down again, verse 26 says, Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew taller. Actually, let me read the verse before that. Verse 25. 
if someone sin against another person, God can mediate for, for the guilty party. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede? But Eli's sons wouldn't listen to their father. For the Lord was already planning to put them to death. So when I was reading the scripture, I realized, I, I, I was saying to myself like, wow, so God actually plans. God actually had a plan. And this plan was already in motion. And these boys, these free boys, they were not captured. They didn't even know the plans that God had. They were just enjoying priestly privileges. So they were eating whatever they want. They were taking meats offered in sacrifice, consecrated, sacred sacrifices that the people brought to God. So think about the despicable acts that they were doing. God hates sin. And because of that, God consecrated the priesthood in Israel to act as a middle point. Okay? Where, where people sin, they would bring an offering to appease God for their sin. And then the priest will be the one who offered these sacrifices to God on behalf of the people. And then God will accept those sacrifices and then God will look away from the sins of the people. Now what these guys did was when people bring offering to God to ask for forgiveness of their sins, these guys will just abuse the offering. In other words, they were making re, re, um, um, repentance, they were making light of repentance. So they, were, they were portraying to the people that it wasn't a big deal to repent from sin. Now, their acts were just unruly acts, but in, in the courts of heaven, this was the offense that was coming up against them. That God detested sin, and to that end, God set them up as a family who mediates between God and the people of sin. And then the, the sons of Eli were making light of this thing that God takes the most serious. And so God set a, a plan in motion. God was already planning to kill them. Yet they were still enjoying their freedom. They were still being free. But as they were being free, and God was setting up a plan to destroy them, God was already inaugurating or ordaining another one in their service. And this one that would replace them will be a captured boy. Will be a boy who was given to God a slave consecrated into the service of God as a lifetime sentence. The captured one. The servant of God. So, verse 26, jump down now. The next verse. It says, Meanwhile, the boy Samuel, so the, the, the sons of Eli refused to take correction, uh, for the Lord was already planning to put them to death. Verse 26 then says, Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew taller. Now, my, 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 my version of the Bible says taller, but the meaning of that word taller means he, he ascended the, the ranks or he, 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 he ascended the heights of spiritual stature. And, and, and the scripture used, the scripture and the, the Bible often use this line for people who carry special assignment. The same was used for John the Baptist when he was born. The Bible says, and the boy was strong in the spirit, in favor with God and with men. And also when Jesus was born, the same phrase, the same line was used. And the Bible says, and the boy grew strong in spirit and in favor with God. And with men, he grew in stature. The says, and, the, and the boy grew in stature and in favor with God and with men. And so also, the same thing, the same um, 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 statement was used here. Verse 26 of second, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. It says, meanwhile, the boy grew taller. It means he grew in stature. And the stature here didn't just mean physically he was growing because obviously he would be growing. Okay? He grew in stature. It is the it is spiritual stature. It is the stamina, the 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 stature, the qualification for the office of the priest. Meanwhile, the sons of Eli were physically grown, but they were reduced in stature. The stature required to prosecute the office of the priest. Meanwhile, a boy Samuel, though. By age, he was just a boy. Yet, the Bible says, he grew taller. He grew in spiritual stature. And he grew in favor with the Lord and with men. 
and I've checked through scriptures, I've always seen that favor always comes with God first before with men. You don't want to have favor with men before with God. It will destroy you. It will set you up against God. It will make you disregard God. The office of the priest gave the sons of Eli favor with men. It gave them respect before men. But that set them up into a freedom that they didn't understand what that, that it was actually slavery to the world. True freedom is slavery to God. And that is for a man who finds favor with God before he finds favor with men. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew taller in spiritual stature. He grew in favor with the Lord and with people. Now, pay attention. I'm going to read a lot of scripture in this particular episode. So, verse 27 then says, One day, a man of God came to Eli and gave him this message from the Lord. Now, I want to begin to speak about priesthood now. So that you understand, because I've been speaking about being a servant of the Lord is being a priest. And being a priest is being a servant of God. And to be a priest that would really serve God, you must be captured. Your life must be sentenced to a lifelong of good for nothing but serving God. And I told you how God intends to make for himself a nation of priests. But because of the rebellion of the people, God settled for a tribe. But God didn't jettison his intention to make for himself a nation of priests. That intention, that will was still active in God. God was working. So I want to show you what God intends for priests to do. So that you can begin to understand more when the Bible says the sons of Eli had no respect for God and they didn't have respect for their priestly duties. What are these duties? So on a day, a man of God, the Bible says, we don't even know who this man is, came to Eli, who was the high priest at this time, and gave him a message from the Lord. And this is the message. I revealed myself to your ancestors when the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt. I chose your ancestor Aaron from among all the tribes of Israel to be my priest. Okay, so God carved out for himself a tribe in Israel, the tribe of Levi, the Levites. And he chose Aaron as the pioneer, as the father of this tribe. Okay, as far as priestly and God ordained priesthood in their lineage. And so God was reminding Eli, who was a priest at this time, reminding him of his requirements and his standard as far as that priesthood, priesthood office is, is concerned. So verse 28 of 1 Samuel chapter 2 says, I chose your ancestor Aaron from among all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer sacrifices. Now I want you to begin to make note now. If you have your pens, I want you to begin to make notes now or begin to underline this in your scripture if you're reading along with me. It says, I chose the tribe of Israel I chose your, four, your ancestor Aaron from among all the tribes of Israel to be my priest to offer sacrifices on my altar to burn incense and to wear the priestly vest as he served me. Remember, Samuel was already wearing this priestly vest. I was says, and the boy served the Lord and he wore linen like that of the priests. So God was saying that I, I chose Aaron, the pioneer of the priesthood line, to offer sacrifices on my altar, to burn incense, and to wear the priestly, the priestly vest as he served me. Underline that word, served me, to serve the Lord. And I assigned the sacrificial offering to your priests. So why do you scorn my sacrifices and offerings? Why do you give your sons more honor than you give to me? For you and they become fat from the best offerings of my people, Israel. So, let me stop from reading that because what then follows was God now measure the judgment. And God said, look, 
none of everyone in your family will begin to die an untimely death none of them will fulfill their days and the way you would know that i am serious about what i'm saying is i will kill your two sons on the same day and everyone in your lineage they will die before their time and those that don't die quickly um they would live a sad and a sorrowful life and god basically pronounced his judgment on the house of eli because eli did not raise his son he did not instill in them the implication or the gravity of being the servant of God. In other words, he raised his sons as free boys. He raised his sons as free people. He did not tell them that to serve God is to be captured by God. To serve God is to be like a servant, is to be like a slave who has nothing else to do, whose life is only lived to please one, the master, the one who owns the slave. So they were raised as free people. And their life lived. Look, it is better not to serve God and just live your miserable free life. But if you choose to serve God and you live a free life serving God, most often than not, you will you will you would meet the fate of the sons of Eli. But God intends for himself to make for himself a nation of priests. Servants who are born servants. Servants who choose slavery. And remember I said slavery is not chains in your hands and, 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 and piercing in your nose and forced to hard labor. Slavery is choosing as an act of your own will that your life will mean nothing, will be used for nothing, will be useful for nothing but the service of God. And only those who approach priesthood this way can only and truly serve God. And to this end, God called a whole nation to himself to make a nation of priests. I'm going somewhere tonight. And then if I jump again. Okay. And so God spoke about this. God spoke about this punishment that was going to, that he measured out to the sons of Eli and to the family of Eli. And then verse 35 says, then I would raise up a faithful priest. I'm going somewhere. And I said, I would prophesy. And so let me go ahead of myself and begin to prophesy. And it's God is raising a new generation of priesthood that will be faithful to him and they will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of the priest. They will be born servants and they will serve God and God will capture them as boys and girls. He will catch for himself young men. He will catch for himself young women. He will catch them and he will malibra and those kupaladi namas. He will, he will bring them into his service on the platform of the captured men. They will be born servants. Their lives will be condemned to nothing. Good for nothing but to serve God. And these are men who will ride upon the heights of the earth. These are men who will take the word. These are men who will pronounce blessings upon the word in the name of the Lord. This is a new nation that God is crystallizing for himself. This is a new nation that God is raising by the power of his own might and by the strength of his spirit. And without fail, this will come to fruition in our generation. It will happen. The captured men, the servants of the Lord, the ones who stand by night in the house of God. Follow me tonight. Then I will, verse 35 now, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35, then says, Then I will raise up a faithful priest, and this is the prophecy, and this is happening in our time. And I will raise up a faithful priest who will serve me and do what I desire. I will, I will establish his family, and they will be priests to my anointed kings forever. Then all of your surviving family will bow before him, begging for money and food. Please, they would say, give us jobs among the priests so we would have enough to eat. Listen to me. This is the counsel of God upon the nations. As many as have worn the priestly garments and have been bringing disrepute in the name of the Lord and have refused to repent, hear the voice of the Lord. God is taking away the oil from you. 
God is taking away the authority and the voice he has given to you. And God is removing his seal of authority that makes you his representative. And God is raising another generation and it is because of the lack of repentance. And God is raising a new generation of priesthood. And this priesthood will be faithful to God. And they will faithfully serve the Lord and discharge the office to which God has called them. And the families of the one who have brought disrepute to the name of the Lord, who has caused the even and the nations of the world to mock God, they will beg to serve as priests again and there will be no place found for them. And chapter 3 opens again, verse 1 of chapter 3 opens again with this same thing that I've been speaking about. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord. Now, let's count how many times the Bible said, the Bible has mentioned that he served the Lord, yet he was a boy. So you see, serving the Lord has nothing to do with age. Serving the Lord has nothing to do with reputation. Serving the Lord has to do with a lifelong commitment of being good for nothing but for God. So that you don't even, there is even nothing else that your life is meaningful for except to please God. Because God said in the last verse, second to the last verse, 35, He says, I will raise for myself faithful priests who will serve me and do what I desire. The generation that will serve the Lord and will do what, is, what He desires. And the Bible started from verse 11 of 1 Samuel chapter 2. He says, And the boy served the Lord. By assisting Eli the priest, he replaced the sons of Eli, yet when he was a boy. And then the second time the Bible said it was in verse 18, 1 Samuel chapter 2. But Samuel, though he was only a boy, served the Lord. He wore the linen garment like the priest. And what does this garment represent? It represents godliness. This garment represented godly, God represents godliness. I will show that to you in scripture. In Psalms 132, verse 16. Psalms 132, verse 16. It says, I will clothe in that day, I will clothe your priests with godliness. So the garment of the priest represents godliness. So Samuel wore godliness as a boy. And do you know why he was able to wear godliness as a boy? He, he didn't know anything else to do with his life. There was nothing else as far as he was concerned. He didn't even know life. The only life he knew was to serve God. So the only thing his life had was godliness. There was nothing else. There was no pollution. There was no use. There was no other relevance for his life except to serve the Lord by assisting the priest. I've been in the temple, in the house of the Lord, and assisting the priest. I know you will ask me, so what does that mean in the time that we're living in? Like, I wasn't born into the house of the Lord. Now, does that mean I can never serve the Lord? I will show you what it means to be a born servant. So that you will know. But at least I'm showing you that it is not a respecter of age. It has to do with being captured. Do you understand that? With the, the prerequisite to serve God is to have a captured life or to have a life that is subjected to captivity by God, to be captured by God. I'm going somewhere. And if you read throughout the epistles and you read throughout the gospels and you read throughout the letters of the apostles, there was this one thing they kept on saying. And it is that the life that you have now, it is no longer your life. It is the life of Christ. So live as a slave. But this time, a slave to Christ, meaning living by the dictates of the Spirit. I began to teach in Romans chapter 8 from verse 5, how the life governed, captured, driven, influenced, controlled by sin leads to death. And the life captured, controlled, influenced by the Spirit leads to life. A captured life by the Spirit. A life that is lived in slavery to the will of the Spirit. These are the servants of God. Not those who wear the garments of a priest. Because you could be wearing the garment of a priest by just being in the lineage of a priest. 
But that does not guarantee that you will serve God. And that doesn't guarantee that your service that you're doing now is acceptable to God. As a matter of fact, God might be making plans to destroy you already. So you may be ordained a pastor. You may be ordained an apostle, a prophet, a bishop. Whatever you ordain as. That ordination doesn't mean anything. Except you intentionally choose the way of captivity. Except you choose the way of the bond servant. You choose the way of being captured. Only then can your ordination begin to please God and begin to serve the purposes of God. If not, you will use that ordination to please yourself. You will live a free life. And that was why Apostle Paul we keep, keep kept saying that even though I am free, I do not use my freedom to do what I like. He says, instead, I choose to be a slave to Christ. These are the servants that God is looking for. And this is the generation of servanthood that God is raising. Those who would choose to be born servant as an act of their own will. They would relinquish the freedom that this world, the illusion of freedom that this, that this world tends to offer or makes you feel that you have. And you would choose to be a captive of the intentions and the will of God. Then and only then can you serve God. So, in, 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 in 1 Samuel chapter 3, the Bible says, Meanwhile, the boy Samuel, and the Bible keeps on emphasizing that though he was a boy, the boy Samuel, the boy Samuel, though he was only a boy, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. And the Bible made a statement that was very, very scary. And made my heart panic when I think about the time that we're living in. It says, now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare. And visions were quite uncommon. The Bible will say in another translation, it says, in those days, the word of the Lord was scarce in the land. We're living in a time where the voice of God is scarce. Everybody is preaching. Everybody is prophesying. Everybody is talking. Everybody is... And, and these people, are they have titles. So they are either a prophet or a pastor or an evangelist or a bishop or an archbishop or whatever. And pay attention, in this time there was a high priest. There was a lineage of priesthood. Yet the Bible says the voice of God. Now in those days, messages from the Lord was very rare. And visions were quite uncommon. But the God was raising for himself a servant that would change this narrative. And this servant is a little boy who, whose life, not even according to before he was even grew to know to choose anything, his life was subjected to a lifelong of servitude. Serving the Lord. Being in the house of the Lord, helping the priest. So you may ask yourself, I wasn't born in church. I wasn't born to a Christian family. I wasn't born to a family who took God seriously. And, but I want to serve God. Does that mean I could never serve God? No. I'm saying to you that the root to serving God is not being born into a house that served God. It's not being born into a Christian family. It's not being born by the altar or being given birth to in the premises of a church. The root to serving God, the kind of servant that God needs, is by the way of captivity. By the way of choosing to be a slave. By the way of relinquishing and rejecting the freedom that the world gives and choosing a life of servitude, condemned to be good for nothing, but to please God. And to carry that and wear that consciously on your garment. You wear godliness as a garment. It becomes your, your default character because of the consciousness of your slavery to him in order to be able to enter into his service. These are the kind of service, these are the kind of servant that God is raising and Samuel was a prototype of this and God was carving out this heritage for himself among the nation of Israel, among the, the nations of the world. And so the voice of God was scarce in the land. And so verse 3, pay attention now. Verse 2, sorry. One night Eli was almost blind by now because he was old. 
He had gone to bed. He was almost blind by now also here. It doesn't, doesn't just deal with the fact that he was physically old. It simply means he, because as a prophet, you hear the voice of God and you see the visions of God. But at this time, as a priest and a prophet, and at this time, he was almost blind. It means he could hardly hear God and he could hardly see a vision from God. Hence, since he was the representative of God in his time, the messages from, from God were rare in his days. And the visions of God was quite uncommon because his family had perverted the way of priesthood. And so there was no priest in the land. So there was no platform through which God can communicate his intentions with the people in the land. So verse 2 says, one back, Eli was almost blind. He was Eli who was almost blind, had gone to bed, and the Lamb of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark. And suddenly the Lord called out to Samuel. Now, if you're familiar with Bible stories, you know what this, this story is saying, but I will just summarize it. So Samuel slept in the in the in the in the temple. Okay? He didn't even sleep in the house. His life was so condemned to the service of God that he, his bed was beside the ark of the covenant. So he slept by the ark. And yet when he was still a boy, a night, on a night, a voice called out, the voice of God called out to him. And Samuel, hearing this voice, because he had never heard God before, he thought it was Eli calling him. Because remember, he was assistant to Eli. He was assisting Eli. So all he, he was just serving Eli. He was just serving Eli. And so when he heard a voice called out to him, he just assumed that it was Eli. So he ran to Eli. And Eli said, no, I didn't call you. Go back and sleep. So he went back to bed. And the voice called the second time. He ran to Eli the second time. And Eli said, look, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. And then the third time now, when he came to Eli and said, look, I heard, I heard your voice. Did you call me? And the Bible says, and Eli realized. Can you see? And, and this, no, if Eli was shocked, the first time Eli would have known that it was God about to speak. But because Eli himself was dead to the voice of God, he took the third time. The Bible says, and Eli then realized that it was God calling the boy. So Eli then told him that now, go back and lie down. And when you hear the voice calling you one more time, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And so when Eli, when, when Samuel went back to lie down again, and the voice called again, the Bible says, and the Lord came and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And then Samuel replied, speak, your servant is listening. You see, before this time, Eli, the Bible says Eli served the Lord by assisting Eli. And Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. He wasn't serving God directly yet. It was, it was, it, 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 Eli was still the one at the forefront of this service. But Eli's service was about to expire because he had, he had, he had perverted the way of priesthood. And so, God couldn't speak to Samuel directly until Samuel was conscious that he was the servant of the Lord. So he, although he was serving, but all he was doing in the beginning was just routine. Okay? That was all he knew. He just grew up as a boy and they just told him, look, just like you grew up in your house and you just do chores in your house. Samuel just grew up doing chores in the house of God. And he was just doing chores as assigned by Eli. So, the Bible called that he was serving God. But at this point, God needed a voice in the earth. And when God needed a voice, God came to the one who was a born servant. Oh my God. Now, remember, there was still the Levitical bloodline. God didn't go to anybody in the Levites' bloodline. He didn't go to the tribe of the Levites to go find a priest for himself. To go find a spokesman for himself. He chose to settle for a boy. Meanwhile, there are adults, grown up people, who were by birth and by lineage descendants of Levi, who were custodians of the priesthood of God. But yet, God bypassed all of those people because they were free people. 
Because the man who was supposed to teach them the way of captivity, to, to teach them the way of being born servants, to enter the service of God, couldn't even teach his own son. How would he teach a whole lineage if he couldn't teach his own sons? To know that to enter God's service is to come by the way of being captured. So God went to a boy who was captured before birth and who started living by default, by consequence of the choices that were made before he was born. He began to, he began to live a captured life. So God set him for a captured little boy. And God came to call him. And when God called unto him, the, 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 the last good thing that Eli did was to teach the boy to be conscious now that his captured life is worthy of being called the servant of God. So when, when Samuel was to respond to God, the third time God came to call, he said, speak, your servant is listening. And the Bible says, immediately, then the Lord said to Samuel, and God began to speak. And the first thing God said to Samuel was that, that he will make sure that he executes the judgment he has passed upon the family of Eli. And the Bible then said in verse 15, that was his, um, Samuel stayed in bed until morning. And when he got up, Eli you know, went to him and said, no, tell me what God has said to you. And Eli swore that if he didn't say the truth, God would kill him. And Samuel told him the truth and said, look, no, God has said he's gonna destroy you. And, and Eli said, look, no, God can do whatever he likes. That's literally what he said. And, 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 and I, want, I want to show you a verse that I love so much. Verse 19. Chapter 3, verse 19. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 19 says, And Samuel grew up. The Lord was with him. And everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. And all Israel from Dan in the north to Bathsheba, to Bathsheba, in the south, knew that Samuel was confirmed as the prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and give messages to Samuel at the tabernacle. So Samuel had now changed the narrative of the voice of God being scarce in that time. It was scarce because there were no men that entered priesthood or that stood in the office of priesthood by the way of being captured. And when God found for himself a captured man, the messages of God returned again. And the whole nation identified that God was speaking again because God had now found for himself a servant. The chronicles of the servants of the Lord. Um, there's so much more that I need to say about this topic. I thought I would be able to do justice to you today, but I, I, I obviously can't. So I'm going to continue next week Friday, and I'm going to keep speaking about captured next week Friday, the servants of God. But let me round up today. God is seeking in our time. He is seeking a lineage, a new lineage. God is seeking for himself to make a new lineage. God is still interested in coming out for himself upon the earth, a nation of priests. And the priesthood that God is looking for will not be like the order of the Le Levitical priesthood because right in the time of the Levitical priesthood, God bypassed the natural order and he went for something. And that thing that God went for is what I came to align to you tonight. God was looking for a born servant. God was looking for one whose life is captured by service. A service that is like a measured out sentence. As though a man committed a crime and he was sentenced to a lifelong punishment. The way to serve God is by the way of being captured. Is by the way of captivity. And it is to be sentenced to a lifelong duties of pleasing God. Of doing what pleases God. And the only way you can live this kind of life is, is to be conscious of being a bond servant. It is to first of all enter into a bond or the chains of service to God and to carry a consciousness of being a bond servant. This is the only way you can serve God and truly carry the messages of God. If not, you will be a pastor, you will be ordained into whatever office you are ordained, but the word of God will be scarce around you. The word of God will be scarce 
around you. But in our generation, I make bold to tell you tonight that the narrative is changing. Many years down the line up until now, the voice of God has been scarce in the earth because priesthood has been perverted. Many people just carry title and carry the oil of ordination and don't know jack about what they should be doing with it. They are not consecrated into a life that pleases God. Their life is not a life of separation and consecration. They still have many alternatives. They still have so many things they wanted to be good for, to be known for, to be relevant for. But God is looking for a generation of people who will be sentenced to a life that is good for nothing except to please God and to serve God. And Jesus, being our high priest, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, Priests are made to offer sacrifices to mediate between God and men a covenant that God made. And the new covenant God made with us is that he will put his laws in our hearts. He will write his laws in our hearts. That we will not need no man to teach us, but the anointed, the spirit that we receive will teach us. And so that we will not have to teach our neighbors and our relatives to serve God, for they will already know God. This was the covenant that God made. And this was the covenant that Jesus died. He became the one, the high priest who offered this sacrifice that set in motion this covenant. And so the priesthood in those days were to offer bulls and rams to remind people of God's covenant with them and to keep them in alignment with God. But the priesthood that Jesus came to pioneer is a priesthood that doesn't offer bulls and rams. Jesus himself became the sacrifice, so he offered himself a sacrifice. And the priesthood he handed over to us is to bring the, the, is to bring the message of this reconciliation to men. And to teach men the consecration and the separation to God as a captured, a bond servant. Is to teach men the way of priesthood. Because remember, Jesus died and high priest. Okay, but he died not to create just followers. He died to crystallize for God a nation of kings and priests. And how do we become a nation of kings and priests? In other words, if you're a pastor, you're not just supposed to be a pastor forever and you just have members forever. It is to raise your church until they all rise up in ranks in the spirit and they take their priesthood position in the nation of God, in the kingdom of God. So the assignment we are given as a nation of priests or the priestly duties that has been given to us is first giving ourselves to God as bond servants in order to enter into his service. And when we enter into the service of God to understand that the service of God is to bring men into the consciousness of the new covenant that God wants to live in the hearts of men. That God wants to govern and guide and rule men from the inside. And so that our lives become a specimen, like Samuel. Her life becomes a prototype. Her life becomes an example of a captured born servant. And we begin to duplicate that until we raise from God a nation of priests. And then and only then will the glory of God return back to his house. That will compel the world to come to the mountain of the Lord's house. Listen to me. The world is not going to come to the mountain of the Lord's house. And the house, the mountain of the Lord's house will not be exalted high above every other mountain until this priesthood is gotten right. Because what are the world, what will the world come to? The Bible says they will, in those days, they will say, let us go to the house of the Lord that he may teach us his ways. And God will teach by his priests. And if there are no priests who are of sufficient stature, the nations are not coming. And so I present to you tonight the contemplation of the heart of God, the bodies of God, to raise a nation of priests by the way of being captured. And so I pray for you tonight that God gives you an understanding heart, that you will indeed understand the words that I've spoken to you tonight. That his words are not my words. They are the contemplation of God. They are the bodies of the heart of heaven. And I have just communicated eternity to you in time tonight. And I pray that God gives you an understanding heart. That these words will not fall by the wayside. These words will not be stolen from your heart by the devil. That these words will begin to compel you to take on a character. And to enter into the service of God by the way of being captured. 
that in your time the voice of God will not be scarce in your family, in your nation, in your cities. The voice of God will not be scarce in your industry, in your career, in the field of your endeavor. The voice of God will not be scarce. You will be the one that provides priesthood to God by which the messages of God comes to bring men to reconciliation, to save a dying world and to bring the judgment of God upon the earth. Even in the name of Jesus. That as you listen to this message again and again, that the spirit of this world will enter into you. And that you will enter, you will come out of the world. And you will come, you will embrace a life of separation, a life of consecration, a life of being good for nothing. Except to serve the purposes of the king, the master of our life. The one who purchased us by a priced possession. That we may become his prized possession. Thank you, Lord, because you have answered our prayers tonight. In the name of Jesus. And I pray that sick bodies be healed. In the name of Jesus. Even as you bring your life under the authority of this word, receive your healing. In Jesus' name. As you begin to make up your mind to serve God, to be a bond servant of God, I command ways to be open for you. Wherever you're stuck in life, in your career, in your business, in your finances, wherever the doors have been shut to you and you are helpless and you are desperate for help, I pray that the help of God begins to find you where you are. In the name of Jesus, that the light of God shines through your darkness, that God removes confusion from your life and make your life, your life illuminated. Make your path straight that you may walk on the path that leads to life, that you will begin to live under the influence of the Spirit of God. In the name of Jesus. And that you will serve the Lord by the way of being captured. In Jesus' most powerful name. Amen. Amen. Apostle Victor, your name again is my name. And I am a born servant of God. I am a captured one. Um, and we will capture the world um, by the strength that the Spirit gives. I will be back again next week, Friday, to continue um, to attempt to round up um, this contemplation. I have a feeling that I will continue speaking about this next week and that will lead us to priesthood. Okay? That will lead us to priesthood, but this will be for Fridays. And of course, on a Sunday, I will return to speak about Dominion Part 2. I hope you're ready. If you haven't listened to Dominion Part 1 um, that I spoke about on um, last week's Sunday, please go listen to it and let it give you a foundation uh, for this Sunday. Invite someone. Please share this message on your platforms. Don't just listen to you all by yourself. Make sure that you are the reason why someone will hear this. And as many people, as, as their life begin to align with God, it will fruit will abound to your account. And, and according to scriptures, you will ask God for anything. And he will do it if you bear fruit and this fruit abound. And this is how to bear fruit. Share the gospel, even in the name of Jesus. I'll see you again on Sunday. Until then, keep keeping the kingdom. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. God bless you. I love you so much. God bless you.